Thank you for joining us again. It's good to have you with us and thinking through these subjects, which are so important. Last week, we looked at who is Jesus? How did the disciples come to declare that he was the son of the living God? How did they come to worship him as the saviour of the world? Sure, Jesus made some outrageous claims that anybody else making them you would dismiss out of hand. We looked at the evidence last week of Jesus's words, Jesus's works, the things that he did, his character and the person that he was. We also looked at the resurrection and the powerful evidence of that. Now today we're going to look at, so what? So what does this mean for us when Paul writes and says that he reconciled us to God by his death? What does that mean? When... The cross is the symbol of the Christian faith. It's kind of like the logo of Christianity. About a third of the Gospels are about the death of Jesus and much of the rest of the New Testament is spent explaining why he died. I found that when I understood why Jesus had died, when I experienced what his death had achieved for me, it changed everything. Why did Jesus die? Well, the answer is because he loves you. There's a verse in the New Testament where Paul says, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. You are loved. That's the message at the heart of the New Testament. And it's the message at the heart of this universe. If you had been the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you. It's as personal as that. He loves you that much. His love for you is unconditional, it's wholehearted, it's continual. It's the greatest love you could ever imagine. And that's the reason for the cross. It's God's amazing love for you. And that understanding completely changed my life. But why was it necessary? What's the problem? You're created in the image of God. God loves you, he created you. That means you're God's masterpiece. There's something amazing about every human being, something noble, something magnificent. Human beings are capable of such extraordinary creativity, music, art, literature. God's made you creative because you're created in his image. Human beings are capable of great self-sacrifice, devotion, kindness. But certainly in my case, there's another side to the coin. We're also capable of bad stuff. You only need to open the newspapers to see that terrible evil going on in this world. But the world is more complex than just saying, well, there are these evil people and they're good people, because it's more mixed than that. People who are capable of great love and devotion and kindness can also do some bad stuff. I've done some bad stuff in my life that I deeply regret. I've, I've hurt people, people that I love. The way the New Testament puts it is like this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word sin can sometimes make me think of religious guilt or things like luxury chocolates and ice cream. The phrase, this is sinful, has become synonymous with something enjoyable. I saw an advert for ice cream that said, it's so good, it's sinful. But sin in the Bible is much more profound and relevant to you and me today than we sometimes realize. We're not talking about accidental mistakes or eating too much chocolate, but our seemingly natural inclination to mess things up, to break stuff like promises and relationships that we care about and even our own well-being. And often we look around at others and think, OK, I get stuff wrong, sure, but comparatively, I'm not that bad, right? There are people doing far worse things than me. And if we're honest, we've all done stuff wrong. Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the glory of God was revealed in Jesus. And compared to him, we all fall a long way short. So you might say, well, in that case, we're all in the same boat. Why does it matter? But there are consequences to the things that we do wrong. And the New Testament describes the impact of sin in a few different ways. Just as the pollution of our environment is a major problem, Jesus said it's also possible to pollute your life, your heart, and this is the pollution of sin. The things we do wrong can spoil our lives. Sin poisons our relationships with one another, and it also spoils our relationship with God. The bad stuff in our lives is also addictive. Sin is powerful. Yeah, I resonate with what St Paul said. What I want to do, I do not do. What I hate, I do. Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. 
So for example, if you take heroin for a sustained period, you'll become addicted. But it's not just hard drugs. It's also possible to be addicted to things like a bad temper, envy, arrogance, pride, selfishness, slander, sexual immorality. This is the slavery that Jesus spoke about that has this destructive power over our lives. There is something in human nature that cries out for justice. Love and justice are not opposed. When we hear about a child being molested or about an elderly person being brutally attacked in their homes, we long for the people who do these things to be caught and punished because we believe there should be a penalty for sin. But it's not just other people's sins that deserve to be punished, it's ours as well. But it's easier to think about other people's and less so about ourselves. St Paul said, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. The things that we do wrong create a barrier. It's a bit like when you fall out with someone you love, like a family member or a close friend, and you can't look them in the eye. It's like there's something that's come between you. And the things that we do wrong, our sin, creates a partition, a barrier between us and God. And it's like the breakdown of a relationship, not just with God, but also all our relationships. That's the problem, that's the bad news. So what's the solution? Well, the good news is that God loves you and he came to the earth in the person of his son to do something about it, to die for you and to die for me. The apostle Peter puts it like this. He himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins in his body. By his wounds, you have been healed. It's been described as the self-substitution of God. What does that mean? On the 31st of July, 1941, sirens rang out from cell block 14 in Auschwitz concentration camp. A prisoner had escaped. And as a reprisal, the Gestapo selected 10 men, arbitrarily, to die in a starvation bunker. The ninth man selected was a man called Francis Gajewniczek. And when he was selected, Francis Gajewniczek cried out. He said, oh, he said, my poor wife and my children, they will never see me again. At that moment, a, a small man with wire-framed glasses took off his cap and he walked forward and he said, I'm a Catholic priest. He said, I don't have a, a wife and children. I want to die instead of that man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. The name of that man was Maximilian Kolbe, 47 years old. And he was taken with the other nine to the starvation bunker. An amazing guy. He, he got them praying, singing hymns. Eventually, they needed the starvation bunker for other people. And so on the 14th of August, 1941, he was given a lethal injection of carbolic acid. 41 years later, on the 10th of October, 1982, the death of Maximilian Kolbe was put in its proper perspective. There in St. Peter's Square, Rome, in a crowd of 150,000 people, was Francis Gajewniczek. And the Pope described the death of Maximilian Kolbe on that occasion in these terms. He said it was a victory like that one by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Maximilian Kolbe had died for someone else instead of someone else. That someone else was Francis Gajewniczek. I happened to see his obituary in the independent newspaper. He died at the age of 93. And he had spent the rest of his life going around the world telling people what Maximilian Kolbe had done for him because he had died in his place. And in an even more remarkable way, Jesus died instead of you and instead of me. Crucifixion was the height of pain and depth of shame. Yet interestingly, the New Testament doesn't dwell on the physical suffering, the torture, 
the crucifixion because actually other people in history have died perhaps even more horrible death physically. Indeed, even now around the world, people are being crucified. But the suffering of Jesus was unique because not only was he suffering physically and emotionally, but he was suffering spiritually because he was bearing on himself your guilt and my guilt. The cross and the resurrection are like one event. And the results of the cross is like the different facets of a beautiful diamond. One facet is, it shows us just how much God loves you. Guilt is feeling bad about the stuff that we've done. Shame is feeling bad about who we are. And on the cross, Jesus took your guilt, your shame, my guilt, my shame. And therefore, there's no need for guilt or shame because you are loved. Your worth is what you're worth to God. And you are of infinite value to God because Jesus died for you. That's how much he loves you. My dad died a couple of years ago after about eight years of suffering from dementia. And it was by far the hardest thing that we as a family have had to deal with. Uh, seeing him go from the sort of loving father and dad and brilliant physicist that he was, um, sort of descending into this fog of memory loss and confusion and anger and fear. Uh, it was horrible to watch. And in those times, I remember asking seriously questions like, why? Why him? Why us? Why now? What possible purpose could that have? How could God allow that to happen to him? How can God allow that to happen to anyone? How can suffering happen when God loves us? And those are questions that crop up a lot in the Bible. You read in the Psalms questions about why is God so far away? And that's how it felt, was God was far away. And, and yet it's important to ask those questions. Being a Christian, believing in God doesn't mean you can't have doubts and ask questions the whole time. You know, Jesus himself cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But actually it was on the cross, it's the death, the suffering of Jesus and his death on the cross, which I found gave me not a complete answer, but some help as I was going through that. Because it helped me understand that God's not aloof, far away, sitting on some cloud, but actually he came in Jesus and suffered himself. He knows what it's like to suffer and he died and therefore he understands what we're going through if we're suffering he's with us in that suffering and eventually my dad uh, died and actually sounds strange to say it but it was a bit of a relief and uh, i had this strange sense of peace all the way through and a lot of that was to do with reading about jesus's resurrection the resurrection of jesus shows us that death's not the end. That ultimately, Jesus has defeated death. And that even though we might suffer now, one day, there'll be no more suffering. And there'll be no more pain.